Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you all again for, for coming out to uh, our symposium on George Whitfield on the occasion of his, uh, the 300th anniversary of his, his birth. Uh, we've had uh, talks last night, an overview of, of George Whitfield and uh, interpreting his legacy, and then excellent panel this morning looking at issues related to Whitfield and Providence and slavery and his uh, incredible amount of time he spent uh, in seafaring, uh, which I learned uh, today that, that he spent more than two years of his life on board ships, uh, and I hadn't realized it was, it was quite that much. Uh, I'm, I'm Dr. Tommy Kidd in the History Department. I'm also the Associate Director of the Institute for Studies of Religion, uh, and I'm also uh, uh, of keen interest about this subject as the author of a, of a new biography of George Whitfield. Uh, so I'm, I'm thrilled to have you all here. I, I should say that we're having uh, this lecture uh, uh, now and, and then I believe at 3.15 we're having a, another lecture by Bruce Heinmarsh. Uh, and I, I should also say, uh, if you didn't hear it this morning, that uh, we in fact have on loan for, for uh, these days a Whitfield uh, field pulpit um, that is at the Armstrong Browning Library, and I think most of you know where that is, but if you don't, you go out of this building, turn right, it's the lovely building down at the corner down there, and yes, indeed, we went to see it, and it is an actual Whitfield field pulpit that they say he you know, would break down and carry around with him and used for about 25 years in his ministry. Uh, I, I think that is well worth seeing. Uh, so I certainly recommend that you st stop by the Armstrong Browning and thank you to the uh, Texas Baptist Historical Commission uh, for going out of their way, really, to lend that uh, to us. It was very, uh, very generous. Well, I have the pleasure of uh, introducing uh, my friend David Bebbington as uh, our, our uh, early afternoon lecturer uh, today. He is the professor, uh, professor of history at the University of Stirling in Scotland and he is also Distinguished Visiting Professor of History at Baylor uh, and has, has visited us, oh, about every fourth semester uh, for about the past, what, 12 years or so, uh, and, and has become a very important uh, friend and, and member of the History Department uh, here as well as at Sterling. Uh, he is the author and editor of many books, and I, I certainly won't even list a fraction of them, but they include uh, Evangelicalism and Fundamentalism in the United Kingdom during the 20th Century, co-edited with da David Carey Jones in 2013, and Baptists Through the Centuries, A History of a Global People, Baylor University Press in 2010. Uh, I have to say I'm most excited, however, about his wife Eileen uh, Bebbington's uh, recent book, uh, more excited than any of David's books. Uh, <laughs> was, it goes without saying. Um, uh, her recently released book, A Pattern Life, Faith, History, and David Bebbington, uh, which I actually posted a, a picture of this on Facebook, if you follow me on Facebook this, this morning. And I have to say this book is, is worth it just for the pictures of David, uh, which, which, which are a hoot. Uh, so anyway, uh, always happy to have our, our friend David Bebbington here, and today he's going to be speaking to us about the legacy of George Whitfield. David. Thank you, Tommy, for the introduction. Let me say I'm grateful for the invitation to speak, and I am also very keen to say two other things. First is that you'll notice that the title in the program is slightly different, though no, significantly different. My topic is, in fact, the legacy of George Whitfield. That's my change. It's nothing to do with the organisers. My topic, therefore, will be the legacy of George Whitfield. The other thing to do is to acknowledge the very considerable help I've received in preparing this paper from my graduate assistant at Baylor on this occasion. That's Adina Johnson, who's sitting over there. And I'd give her a metaphorical round of applause at this point. I'm also glad to be in this building because we are within sight of Patneff Hall. And Patneff Hall, I find a singularly inspiring building. Have you noticed that across the front of this main administrative building in the university, it says as follows, the preservers of history are as heroic as its makers. And I really like that. Yeah. 
So, with those preliminary remarks, let me talk about the legacy of George Whitfield. In 1865, a novel was published in London called The Diary of Mrs. Kitty Trevelyan. The writer was described as the author of the Chronicles of the Schoenberg Cotter family, a story of Luther seen through the eyes of his printer's children, published two years before, and a huge literary success. The author, preferring anonymity because she was a woman, was Elizabeth Charles, then in her late 30s, who was able to write extensively because of a childless marriage. Elizabeth had been swayed by the Oxford movement, become attracted to the Roman Catholic Church, had been rescued from the brink of conversion by a Swiss Protestant pastor, and had become a friend of the wife of Dean Stanley, the figurehead of the Broad Church Party in the Church of England. She therefore had very wide religious sympathies, and they're apparent in her historical fiction. The subtitle of the diary of Mrs. Kitty Trevelyan was a story of the times of Whitfield and Wesley. The fictional author of the diary, Kitty, is invited with her aunt and cousin Evelyn to attend an evening meeting at the London residence of the Countess of Huntingdon, Whitfield's evangelical patron. The lady who had invited them had recently become very religious. She recommended the preacher as a wonderful orator no, com no commonplace fanatic. His discourses, the friend tells Kitty's aunt, are quite such as you would admire, quite suited to people of the highest intellectual powers. And so the aunt and the two girls attend, with cousin Evelyn professing conversion soon afterwards. What does Kitty remember of Whitfield? Just a man, she records, striving with his whole heart and soul to win lost souls out of a perishing, sorrowful world to Christ and holiness and joy. Just the conviction poured in on the heart by an overwhelming torrent of pleading, warning, tender, fervent eloquence that Christ Jesus the Lord cares more infinitely to win and save the lost than man himself. This impression is tinctured by the romantic sensibility of the age, rather like George Eliot's depiction of the Methodist preacher Dinah Morris in Adam Bede, published six years before. The representation of Whitfield in his message is more sentimental than accounts of the preacher's contemporaries. Yet it is highly revealing. Nearly a century after his death, Whitfield seemed worth celebrating in a popular novel. He'd become part of the folklore of England as a cultivated man suited to London salons and yet a passionate evangelist with superb rhetorical powers. Whitfield was a person who had entered the public memory. How was he remembered in the centuries after his death in 1770? We can distinguish seven different ways. Firstly, the man. Naturally, Whitfield's biographers normally represent the evangelist as a great man. The first biographer, John Gillies, a Scottish Presbyterian minister writing in 1772, was concerned to vindicate Whitfield's reputation. And exactly 200 years later, John Pollock, an evangelical Anglican clergyman, remained almost wholly uncritical. The biographers could point to contemporary estimates that applauded Whitfield's personal qualities. Thus, Joseph Belcher, a Baptist pastor who had emigrated from England to North America and wrote the standard biography of Whitfield in the mid-19th century, published by the American Tract Society in 1857, could quote the weighty opinion of Whitfield's American publisher, Benjamin Franklin, that the preacher was marked by integrity, disinterestedness, disinterestedness and indefatigable zeal in every good work. Belcher himself singled out as Whitfield's outstanding personal traits, his indifference to his own honour and case, his being fond of labour, and his devotional spirit. That was the normal image that was projected by biographers. Whitfield was unselfish, 
dizzyingly energetic and profoundly devout. Even Wesleyan Methodist writers about Whitfield, who might have been expected to have a doctrinal axe to grind against the Calvinist opponent of the Arminian John Wesley, bore testimony to such qualities. Thus, Luke Tyerman, a Wesleyan minister writing a two-volume biography in 1876, while announcing that as an Arminian he differed from Whitfield, acknowledged the spiritual eminence of his subject. Whitfield's power, Tyerman claimed, was not in his talents, nor even in his oratory, but in his piety. Over a century later, Gordon Rupp, the leading Methodist historian, recognised in Whitfield a deep simplicity and an abiding generosity of spirit. So Whitfield was much celebrated for his personal qualities. Yet, the preacher's characteristics as a man were subject to severe criticism also. During Whitfield's lifetime, he was the object of scurrilous satire. In 1746, for example, he was represented as Dr. Peach Field, a hypocrite guilty of adultery in a stage play by Charles Macklin, A Will and No Will. Samuel Foote in The Minor labelled Whitfield Squintum, a name which stuck because of Whitfield's severe squint in his left eye, in order to suggest not just physical disability, but moral delinquency. Whitfield's own circle included a few who acknowledged personal failings. Thus, Cornelius Winter, one of the ablest English preachers encouraged by Whitfield, admitted that he was impatient of contradiction. Subsequent writers sympathetic to Whitfield sometimes also conceded that he had flaws. J.R. Andrews, an English barrister who celebrated Whitfield's glorious career in 1864, nevertheless felt bound to recognise that he was irritable at trifles and apt to form hasty judgments of people. Those with less regard for Whitfield could be far more censorious. Thus, Horton Davis, the historian of worship and theology in England, pointed to Whitfield's naivety, his deplorable lack of taste and insensitivity, and even an egotistical brashness. By the 20th century, writers sometimes felt compelled to look back with some condescension. Although Albert Belden was a de devotee of Whitfield, who'd commenced the Congregational Mission Church uh, in central London, of which Belden was superintendent, his 1930 biography dwelt on the psychology that he saw as a necessary tool of analysis in the modern world. Hence, Belden concluded that in Whitfield's career, the dominating unconscious motive was undoubtedly a strong reaction to an inferiority feeling. I'm not sure how he knew that. <laughs> the charge was also mounted in the 20th century that Whitfield was guilty of anti-intellectualism. Sidney Mead, among the most distinguished of American historians, wrote in 1977 that Whitfield's revival style could hardly be dignified as an appeal to constructive reason. Whitfield was condemned as a representative of a whole revival tradition, and sometimes he was given dismissive comments which were intended to apply to that whole tradition. He was, they said, culpably separating religion from the intellect. Many criticisms are summarised in the article in the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography by Boyd Schlenther, a historian who is very familiar with the sources. Whitfield's treatment of his wife is a special cause of complaint, but the preacher is also condemned for a variety of failings, including overconfidence and financial mismanagement. So, as Schlenkther very fairly concludes, there's been an enduring debate about the man, with some, including nearly all his biographers, almost entirely sympathetic, and so verging on hagiography, and with others strongly inclined to depict Whitfield in far less favourable terms. Whitfield was a man who, in his day, roused strong emotions for and against, and that division of opinion has remained ever since. Secondly, the preacher. The attention of posterity has rightly focused on Whitfield the preacher, 
Accounts of his brilliance as a public speaker abound in contemporary records. Therefore, later judgments also dwell on his preaching legacy. J.P. Gladstone, the Congregational Minister of Tottenham Court Road Chapel, once Whitfield's own congregation in central London, declared a century after the preacher's death that the influence of his popular oratory could still be traced in Gledstone's own day. Often, those who celebrated Whitfield's memory used the metaphor of fire. For John Glanville, Whitfield's successor in the mid-19th century at Bristol Tabernacle, the evangelist's preaching was all fire and flame, shooting out red-hot thunderbolts against the citadels of sin. Likewise, in the mid-20th century, Martin Lloyd-Jones, the minister of Westminster Chapel, London, as an eminent pulpiteer of his day, well qualified to judge, spoke of Whitfield's sermons as not polished essays, but marked by the zeal, the fire, the passion, the flame of an ardent orator. Lloyd-Jones assessed Whitfield as beyond any question the greatest English preacher who has ever lived. Now, Lloyd-Jones, a very forceful Welsh nationalist, added a characteristic qualification. His evaluation applied to England only. One of Whitfield's Welsh contemporaries, Daniel Rowland, was at least his equal, according to Lloyd-Jones. But then Lloyd-Jones was prepared to go on to claim that these two were probably the greatest preachers since the days of the Apostles. Quite a claim. Other opinions have been rather less sweeping. The preeminent American church historian of the second quarter of the 20th century, William Warren Sweet, held that Whitfield was simply the greatest preacher of the century. Sidney Alstrom, an American church historian of the next generation, was prepared to go further. Whitfield was one of the greatest preachers ever. Few have doubted then Whitfield's commanding powers as a deliverer of sermons. Some later commentators tried to dissect Whitfield's style. One of the most thorough analyses appeared in an anonymous article in the Evangelical Magazine in London in 1853. The characteristics singled out may say as much about the mid-19th century priorities as the marks of Whitfield's presentations, but they do reveal what was most valued about the evangelist's legacy. First came the prominence given to the leading truths of salvation and the constant exaltation of Christ in them. Here was comment on the content. Whitfield concentrated on the basics of the gospel, pointing out the way to the new birth through dwelling on the work of the Saviour. Second, according to the Evangelical Magazine article, was a glow of feeling and a melting compassion which revealed his own soul. Whitfield, the writer was observing, showed a passionate empathy with his hearers. He not only proclaimed truths, but feeling them powerfully himself, he was eager to impose them on the hearts of his audiences. Next came the direct address of his ministry. As other commentators noted, Whitfield frequently used the word you. He spoke directly to each individual listening to his words. And last was his habitual dependence on the Spirit of God, his earnest aspiration for the manifestation of his power. Whitfield, that is to say, did not only merely rely on the techniques of his own invention, but sought the help and blessing of the Holy Spirit in his ministry. The author was clearly hoping to rouse imitation of Whitfield by preachers in his own day, and there can be no doubt that he succeeded. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, the greatest preacher of the 19th century, was learning his art at exactly the time this article appeared, and may well have read it. In any case, Spurgeon, sometimes called the modern Whitfield, certainly modelled his own pulpit ministry on Whitfield's career. Whitfield exercised a powerful influence then over subsequent generations of evangelical preachers. More specifically, certain qualities of Whitfield's preaching style can be isolated. James Hamilton, a leading mid-19th century Presbyterian minister in London, remarked that his greatness lay not in his preparation, but in his delivery. 
Many declared Hamilton have surpassed him as sermon makers, but none has approached him as a pulpit orator. Accordingly, it was the voice that was frequently emphasised. William Jay, long congregational minister at Bath, recounted in the mid-19th century that he'd been told by Cornelius Winter, latterly Whitfield's lieutenant, that the evangelist's voice was incomparable because it was so distinct, so loud, and so abounding inflection. The Swedish historian of preaching, Archbishop Brilioff, writing in the mid-20th century, concluded that a melodic tone of voice and an expressive shading of address were Whitfield's greatest assets. To the voice, it was remembered that Whitfield typically added a full heart. He would pour emotion into his addresses, as commentators, including William McLaughlin, a 20th century American historian of revivalism, uh, uh, frequently appreciated. The bare text of the sermons, according to McLaughlin, might seem banal, but the emotional content transfigured them. And Whitfield was a master of storytelling. He possessed, according to Joseph Belcher, a peculiar talent for making a narrative of facts in the pulpit. The tales Whitfield told riveted his audience. So features of his manner were remembered as particularly telling. Consequently, it has often been considered that Whitfield was a great loss to the stage. That is the prevailing line of interpretation in Harry Stout's biography of 1991, The Divine Dramatist. But it had frequently been pointed out before Belcher's popular account of 1857 recalled that the eminent actor David Garrick, a contemporary of Whitfield's, was reduced to weeping by the evangelist's bursts of passion. So Whitfield could make a powerful impression on the professionals of the stage. John Stoughton remarked in 1878 that since Whitfield was endowed with wonderful histrionic powers, he had qualities which would have made him a great actor. And Horton Davis, in a coded assessment of 1961, pointed out not only that Whitfield possessed the actor's adaptability, but also that the London stage laughed at Whitfield because he denounced the stage a rival attraction. This preacher threw the whole of his body into his delivery of a sermon. In 1972, Sidney Alstrom reported that on one occasion, a German woman, knowing no English at all, heard Whitfield preach. She declared afterwards that she'd never been so edified by another sermon. The inference is clear. For the woman, the action of the preaching was decisive. What he did with his body, the impression he made on the audience. Whitfield, therefore, has been remembered as a preacher who might have graced the stage as much as the pulpit. Thirdly, the evangelist. The message that Whitfield brought was consistently the opportunity of new birth. John Angel James, Congregational Minister in Birmingham, when speaking at a Whitfield commemoration in 1853, took as his text Philippians chapter 3 verse 13, this one thing I do. He meant to convey that Whitfield was single-minded. The evangelist, according to James, preached a gospel of redemption and regeneration. And Whitfield was remembered for carrying the message round Great Britain and her colonies as an energetic itinerant. Edwin Gaustad, a recent Baptist historian, spoke of the bustling, driving Whitfield as a one-man earthquake. His ministry in the open air was normally celebrated whenever he was discussed. After all, as Lloyd-Jones insisted, Whitfield was the pioneer of field preaching. And the outcome was reported dramatically. Thus, the visit of Whitfield to Scotland to preach at Cambus Lang, according to W.G. Blakey, a professor of the Free Church of Scotland in 1888, assembled multitudes. The result, Blakey declared, was like those of the day of Pentecost at Jerusalem. Whitfield, with his powerful voice, could address thousands at a time, Consequently, he's often been assessed as the inaugurator of the tradition of organised revivalism. 
That is how the sober historian of revivals, W.G. McLaughlin, regarded him. And that is how a more popular chronicler of revivalism, Bernard A. Weisberger, located him in a book of 1957. Whitfield, according to Weisberger, was mass evangelism's true father. There was a golden thread running from Whitfield to Billy Graham. That image led on to another that has exerted a potent influence over present day assessments of Whitfield. In 1994, Frank Lampert depicted Whitfield as a man who employed all the marketing skills of a rising commercial society. Whitfield was a master of the media, in his, his case, the press and book publishing. Like Billy Graham, Whitfield took pains to gain good advanced publicity. Other historians, however, have wanted to diminish his stature. Apart from those like Sidney Mead who've wanted to dismiss his large-scale events as mere emotional upheavals, there have been others like Sidney Alstrom who have wished to place Whitfield's contribution to the Great Awakening in a broader perspective. Although many were inspired to imitate Whitfield, Alstrom argued, the chief work of reviving New England was carried forward by regular ministers rather than by itinerants. Those who made this point could draw on a well-established estimate of Whitfield. Whitfield was perceived, often by contrast with Wesley, as no organisation man. Whitfield, unlike his contemporary, left no denomination behind him in England or the colonies. His Calvinistic Methodist network dissolved through his own neglect. Belcher put the point epigrammatically in 1857. Whitfield was sold. Wesley was system. The same case was presented with some rhetorical exaggeration by Stuart Henry a century later. It was a characteristic of the free soul, Whitfield, that he had no commerce with organized religion and religious organizations as such. As a traveling evangelist, Whitfield was not to be tied down to mere bureaucracy. In the eyes of many, that was a defect rather than a strength. Yet, Whitfield made a huge and enduring impact by his evangelism. In Wales, the Calvinistic Methodist network did service, though far more through the efforts of Whitfield's Welsh colleagues, led by Howell Harris, than through his own. Lloyd-Jones claimed Whitfield as the first moderator of the Welsh Calvinistic Methodist Church, though with some anachronism, since that body did not organise separately from the Church of England until 1811. But in the 19th century, that body rose to become the largest non-conformist denomination in Wales. In England, Congregationalism benefited greatly from Whitfield's gospel preaching. In Gloucestershire, Whitfield's native county, in particular, a series of congregations owing their origin to Whitfield with Rodborough Tabernacle as their fulcrum, were served by dedicated lay preachers long into the 19th century. Elsewhere, strong individual congregations, often called tabernacles, gradually turned into congregational churches. Thus, at Plymouth, Andrew Kinsman, who had been converted through reading a Whitfield sermon in 1740, became a regular preacher of Whitfield's tabernacle at Plymouth in 1750. After Kinsman's death, it became an ordinary but vigorous congregational church. The Baptists of England benefited from individuals rather than whole congregations. Between 1760 and 1820, the particular Baptist churches of London drew a majority of their ministers from outside the Baptist ranks, and a very high proportion were Whitfieldites. The highly influential Baptist minister of Cambridge, Robert Robinson, had been converted under Whitfield. The evangelical movement in the Church of England owed Whitfield a great debt too. Whitfield himself, an Anglican clergyman, was a model for many later men, even if they normally preferred to serve in a particular parish rather than itinerating. And Rowland Hill, Whitfield's chief nominally Anglican disciple in the next generation, maintained his travelling methods down to his death in 1833. The American colonies perhaps benefited most from Whitfield's ministry. 
Many converted under his preaching stayed in their home congregations, whether congregational, Baptist or Anglican. But others seeking committed gospel ministers and converted church members left New England Congregationalism to form separate congregational churches, and many of them evolved into separate Baptist churches. Two particularly significant figures who had been awakened under Whitfield followed that path, Shubal Stearns and Daniel Marshall. They moved from New England to Sandy Creek, North Carolina in 1755, forming a Baptist church and then an association. And from its vigorous growth on Whitfieldite lines developed the Baptists of the South. The roots of Southern, the Southern Baptists in revivalism are evidenced by the altar calls that still mark so many of their services. Ultimately, that practice is testimony to the legacy of George Whitfield and triumphs even over noise. Good. Fourthly, the Calvinist. <laughs> that was a premature observation on my part. You're being heckled. I am. Fourthly, the Calvinist. It was hard to remember Whitfield without encountering his Calvinism. The teaching of the Genevan reformer not only coloured Whitfield's preaching, but also led him to a fierce exchange with the Arminian John Wesley. Denominations with a reformed inheritance long approved this aspect of the evangelist. In the mid-19th century, the Baptist, Joseph Belcher, still asserted in America that the secret of Whitfield's power lay in his theology, though he stressed not its Calvinistic nature, but its perfect simplicity and universal application. Alexander Thompson, in paying tribute to John Calvin on behalf of the Congregational Union of England and Wales on the tercentenary of the Reformer's death in 1864, listed Whitfield as one of those influenced for good by Calvin. And Charles Hodge of Princeton Seminary, a keen exponent of reform teaching, claimed that the success of the Great Awakening that Whitfield led was the result of its Calvinistic doctrines. But Calvinism started to fall into decay from the mid-19th century onwards. Thus, there was a, the fruit of a reaction against any systematic divinity in favour of the broad, plain statements of scripture. The evangelist Dwight L. Moody was typical of the late 19th century in trying to preach in a way which was acceptable to Calvinists and Methodists alike. His successor, Billy Sunday, still favoured Whitfield, but not because he was a Calvinist. Sunday once urged going back to the old-time truths preached by Finney, Wesley, Whitfield, the Puritans and Martin Luther, a mixture of Calvinists and anti-Calvinists. If Whitfield was valued in the later 19th and early 20th centuries, he was usually not because he was a Calvinist. The resulting ambiguities in attitude towards Whitfield are evident in the biography of an evangelist published uh, of the evangelist published by J.P. Gladstone, superintendent of Whitfield's Tottenham Court Road Chapel in London in 1871. Admiration for the man who, with his brethren, reanimated the dying religion of the whole British people breathes through Gladstone's pages. But the author is embarrassed by Whitfield's Calvinism. Gladstone put in a good word for the evangelist's theological convictions. His Calvinism was not, as it never is in the purest hearts, a cold system of divinity. Instead, it embodied the truth that man must in no sense be a saviour of himself. Yet Gladstone regrets that Whitfield ever launched into any system. In particular, he laments that the evangelist held the dark and terrible doctrine of reprobation, but counters by claiming that Whitfield lacked all bigotry and believed in the infinite love of God more firmly than in anything else. Something of why Gladstone took this line is apparent from various other remarks. He believed in the motif of spontaneous growth of the spiritual life, if not inhibited by stunted forms, 
and he eagerly insisted that Whitfield had a love for scenery so that he was not a dull soul without delight in nature. Here was an interpretation of Whitfield that drew on romantic cultural categories, growth and nature. Whitfield was fitted into a preconceived notion of what any sensitive soul must feel. Hence, the firmer doctrinal affirmations of the Reformed faith were treated as unwelcome incidentals in Whitfield's story. And the tendency was taken further in the 20th century. Distaste for Calvinism actually marginalised Whitfield altogether. In the long popular history of the Con Christian Church, published in 1918 by Williston Walker, a Congregationalist who taught at Yale from 1901, Whitfield there is treated as an outlier in the account of the Wesleys and Methodism. Only five sentences are accorded to Whitfield's career in America. In the biographies of Whitfield of this period, Calvinism is deprecated. Thus, in Belden's English biography of 1930, Whitfield is described as caught in Calvin's obsession with the element of necessity in life. And in the American biography by uh, the Methodist Stuart Henry in 1957, there's an elaborate attempt to exculpate Whitfield from the crime of Calvinism. Whitfield, it is conceded, upheld a Calvinist creed, but his vigorous faith could not be confined by it. And so he preached that man could help to save himself. He professed Calvinism, says Henry, lived by an Arminian faith and preached them both. Thus Whitfield was remoulded to fit the presuppositions of the age. Yet Whitfield was to contribute to the reformed resurgence that marked the later years of the 20th century. An early expression was in the circle of Genevan theologians who tried to rouse English congregationalism to a sense of its reformed inheritance from the 1930s onwards. B.L. Manning, one of their number who was a fellow in medieval history at Jesus College, Cambridge, wrote in 1939 that behind all living Calvinism is the evangelical experience of the saved soul. And instanced, intriguingly, Augustine, the medieval theologian Bradwardin, Calvin and Whitfield. More influential in reviving Calvinism was the movement associated with the Banner of Truth magazine launched in England in 1955. The logo chosen for the magazine and the large number of Puritan reprints that soon began to appear was a statue of George Whitfield. The evangelist loomed large in the propaganda of the movement. It was commonly held that Calvinism, by leaving the choice of the elect to the Almighty, inhibited active efforts for the spread of the gospel. But the great lesson of Whitfield, according to Martin Lloyd-Jones, was to nail that lie which says that Calvinism and an interest in evangelism are not compatible. Thus, Whitfield played a significant part in one of the major theological developments of the later 20th century, the resurgence of Calvinism. Fifthly, the cooperator. Whitfield believed in cooperation between Christians who'd experienced the new birth. He was willing to preach for all groups who shared that faith, whatever their denominational affiliation. Thus, when invited to Scotland by the seceding Presbyterians who believed that the Church of Scotland had abandoned scriptural standards of belief and practice, Whitfield travelled north but refused to be bound to preach for the seceders alone and so received their anathemas. The preacher's interdenominational temper was often praised in later years. Gladstone, writing in 1871, dedicated his biography to the memory of an evangelist who was not only self-sacrificing, but also Catholic because he believed in Christian cooperation. Whitfield was, according to Gladstone, a brother of all who in every place and under any denomination call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. By the second edition of his biography 30 years later, in 1901, Gladstone went even further. It was a period when the Free Churches of England and Wales were coming together in joint councils for common work. Noting that Whitfield was ahead of his time in declaring 
that no form of church government excludes all other forms, Gladstone exclaimed, is that not the ideal of Christian fellowship to which all churches are now moving? Likewise, in America, Williston Walker commented in 1918 that Whitfield held views more typical of the early 20th century than of the 18th century. Whitfield was a man absolutely without denominational feeling in an age when such feelings were intense. Whitfield, in short, was presented as a pioneer ecumenist. Others interpreted Whitfield's spirit of cooperation rather differently. Whitfield, they recognised, was unwilling to hold out the hand of fellowship to all. On the contrary, he denounced, especially early in his career, the clergy who did not preach a soul-saving gospel. His condemnations were severe and sometimes, as he later admitted, unfounded. This censorious disposition was often made the leading ground of criticism by those unsympathetic to Whitfield. But the insistence on placing boundaries around the groups with whom cooperation was possible found favour elsewhere. In the 1960s, Martin Lloyd-Jones, the architect of the Calvinist resurgence, was prepared to end relations with others if they would not join him in an exclusively evangelical fellowship. He disliked the ecumenical trends of his day because of their doctrinal laxity. He urged all his fellow believers to leave their existing denominations in order to form a purely evangelical body. Accordingly, his interpretation of Whitfield's cooperative spirit differed from that of those who discerned a proto-ecumenist. One of the lessons of Whitfield, according to Lloyd-Jones, was the need for orthodox faith. Accordingly, the evangelist was admirable because, like Calvin, he urged unity among evangelicals alone. Whitfield, paradoxically, was presented by Lloyd-Jones as an anti-ecumenical figure. The cooperative dimension of Whitfield's ministry was so striking that even Methodists were persuaded of its importance. As Arminians, they might have been expected to find grounds for condemning Whitfield, but in general, they approved him. It's true that Henry C. Sheldon, a Methodist professor at Boston University, writing in 1894, when recounting the estrangement between Whitfield and Wesley over Calvinism, took the side of Wesley, insisting that he could not have done otherwise in the dispute. But normally, the Methodist approach was to minimize criticisms of Whitfield. Whitfield practically belonged to no denomination, according to his Methodist biographer Luke Tyerman in 1876, but was a friend to all. Whitfield brought more benefits to Methodism, Tyerman argued, than was usually imagined. In the American colonies, for example, he prepared the way for Wesley's itinerants who first arrived in the New World in the year before Whitfield's death. Similarly, Stuart Henry, a Methodist writing in 1957, recorded that Whitfield was willing to work with any who agreed with him on essentials. That his conception of essentials, Henry went on, was less, less flexible than our own is a characteristic of his century, not of his creed. Consequently, Methodists were prepared to see Whitfield as almost one of their own. In the Revivalist magazine, issued from Louth in Lincolnshire, England in the 1850s, Whitfield's ministry was several times held up for admiration. And the New England Methodist Conference chose to hold its 1851 session in the building over the crypt holding Whitfield's bones, symbolising its appropriation of the spirit of the evangelist. Doctrinal disagreement, then, did not prevent Methodists from recognising Whitfield's eminence as a preacher of the gospel. His cooperative spirit won over potential critics over the centuries. Sixthly, the American. America figures largely in Whitfield's posthumous reputation. His seven tours through the colonies meant that he was closely identified with the New World. David Kerry Jones has emphasised Whitfield's international role through his correspondence as well. Historians have highlighted aspects of his American ministry. Thus, William Warren Sweet, 
in the general history of religion in America allocated as many as four pages to Whitfield's scheme for an orphanage in Georgia. Whitfield became entangled in slavery, defending the institution and becoming a slaveholder himself. Here was a facet of Whitfield's role in America that has attracted censure, especially from more recent historians such as Gordon Rupp and Stephen J. Stein. But both orphanage and slavery rooted Whitfield in American soil. The evangelist's Americanness could sometimes be termed to surprising ends. In 1930, for example, the British Prime Minister, Ramsay MacDonald, in a book forward, celebrated Whitfield as a transatlantic cultural bond. It is particularly happy, MacDonald wrote, that this story of the greatest evangelist of the English-speaking race should be a heritage held in common by our American cousins and ourselves. Whitfield, MacDonald said, was therefore a harbinger of world peace. He might bring the nations together. Earlier, however, Whitfield had been a cause of transatlantic rivalry. Some biographers dwelt on his Englishness. For Gladstone in 1871, for example, he was an Englishman with a rough, unsparing hand and an honest heart. Assertions of English claims on Whitfield led to contention over his bones. There was dissatisfaction that his mortal remains lay in a crypt in a Presbyterian church in Newburyport, Massachusetts. Surely they should be buried in his native land. In particular, the congregations of Whitfield's former churches in London wanted his remains returned to England in the 19th century, and Albert Belden, superintendent of one of them, still hoped to achieve that goal in 1931. I confess, declared the evangelist Henry Vincent, visiting Whitfield, Whitfield's mausoleum in 1867, that as an Englishman, I envy America the possession of the earthly remains of dear George Whitfield. Because Whitfield's skeleton was on open display at Newburyport, there was actually opportunity for international theft. In the 1820s, Robert Bolton, Congregational Minister at Henley-on-Thames in England, asked a friend travelling in, in America to obtain a Whitfield autograph letter for him. The friend did better. He stole the main bone from Whitfield's right arm from the Newburyport crypt and sent it in a parcel to Henley-on-Thames. Bolton was aghast, but did not return the bone until 1849, when it was restored to its place in a solemn ceremony. It is extraordinary that international rivalry went so far. The question of the extent of Whitfield's identification with colonial discontents arises at this point. How far was he involved in the currents of feeling that led to the American Revolution? Church historians touched on the issue in the later 20th century. Winthrop S. Hudson, writing in 1965, described the Great Awakening as doing more to create a national consciousness among the various colonies than either colonial wars or political squabbles with the mother country, pointed to Whitfield as one of the rallying names. There was stress on Whitfield's role in binding together the colonies in a common cause. George Whitfield, according to Alstrom, was perhaps the first American public figure to be known from New Hampshire to Georgia. In 1966, a general historian, Alan Heimart, entered the fray arguing that evangelical Calvinism forged the radical ideology that lay behind the revolution. Lambert's biography, published in 1994, took up the theme in relation to Whitfield, contending that the evangelist was Americanized, for example, in resisting the wish of the Archbishop of Canterbury to make his Bethesda orphanage an exclusively Anglican institution on the grounds of the unconquerable attachment of Americans to toleration principles. This line was taken to an extreme in a popular biography of 2001 by Stephen Mansfield, who was subsequently to write of the faith of Presidents Bush and Obama, and also a book with the following title, Mansfield's Book of Manly Men, an utterly invigorating guide to being your most masculine self. <laughs> Now, Mansfield's title instilled uh, 
in, entitled America's Forgotten Foundi Founding Father, actively represented Whitfield's actively teaching revolutionary ideals. But such an estimate of Whitfield cannot be sustained. He died in 1770, long before the revolution, and was himself no politician. A more judicious verdict has been offered by Tommy Kidd. The Great Awakening had at most an indirect effect on the revolution by providing a form of moralistic popular address that helped mobilize the population. In this field, Whitfield was a master, and to that extent, he did contribute to the processes leading to American independence. Whitfield then may have swayed America, but he was no simple politician. Seventhly, and finally, the icon. Whitfield became a figure who was venerated in popular memory. He aroused extraordinary flights of language. Robert Baird, though a sober Presbyterian commentator on American religious affairs, wrote in 1840 that Whitfield was like the angel symbolized in the apocalypse as flying through the heavens, having the everlasting gospel to preach to the nations. Places were long associated with his memory. The villagers of Ipswich, Massachusetts, were still calling a large stone Whitfield's pulpit in the 1840s. As late as 1913, Brookfield, Massachusetts, had Whitfield's Rock. The crypt at Newburyport Presbyterian Church, where Whitfield's bones lay, was turned into a shrine. In 1775, American soldiers on their way to rouse Canada for the Patriot cause stopped in Newburyport to hear a sermon in the church. Afterwards, their officers filed down into the crypt. The coffin of Whitfield was open, and they snipped off parts of his collar and wristbands to take as sacred tokens into battle. Once the body had decomposed into a skeleton, it remained on public display. In the late 19th century, a glass lid was added to the coffin, and a cast of Whitfield's skull was provided so that visitors could hold the reproduction, cuddle it, rather than the original. Meanwhile, in Gloucestershire, England, Rodborough Tabernacle preserved Whitfield's chair, his bureau, and his tea caddy. When, in 1839, the Congregational Ministers of the County organised a public meeting in the open air to commemorate the preacher, some 20,000 people thronged together. A few fastidious persons, it was recorded at the time, thought the preachers dwelt more on Whitfield than was seemly. Whitfield, in fact, was elevated to something like the status of a Roman Catholic saint. He became a popular icon. Much of the commemoration was not merely antiquarian. It was keenly hoped that his achievements would be reproduced in a later age. At the 1839 event, the crowd sang a hymn written for the occasion by Josiah Conder, the leading congregational literateur of the age. Where is the voice of Whitfield now? Where does his mantle rest? Oh, for Elisha's from the plough, with kindred zeal possessed. Similar sentiments resounded down the years. What Alexander and Caesar are to those who have not yet ceased to learn war, wrote Belcher in America in 1857, that Whitfield and Wesley are to those who aspire to eminent usefulness as ministers and messengers of the cross. The Christian, the English periodical most committed to revivalism, urged its readers to circulate Gladstone's biography of Whitfield in 1871, Every page has something that may be turned to account in service for Christ. Even among early 20th century ministers swayed by liberal currents, Whitfield remained for some an exemplar. Albert Belden, though acclaiming modern theological findings, hoped that through his new biography of Whitfield in 1930, fire should fall from heaven again upon the churches. Whitfield was to be admired rather than evaluated. That feeling led to a sharp controversy amongst Calvinists on the publication of Harry Stout's study of Whitfield in 1991. Stout, himself an upholder of reformed theology, but professor of American Christianity at Yale Divinity School, was assailed by the editor of the Banner of Truth, Ian Murray, for daring to criticize Whitfield. Stout defended himself robustly. 
critical evaluation was legitimate. That episode illustrates that, me, that to many, Whitfield was above criticism still. He remained, in some eyes, an icon. And so what could we say overall about the legacy of Whitfield? He left a multiform legacy. His reputation as a man varied with detractors as well as eulogists. As a preacher, however, he was remembered as a superb exponent of pulpit style. He was an evangelist whose impact remolded many Christian traditions. Whitfield's Calvinism was sometimes an embarrassment to subsequent writers, but he helped inspire the reformed resurgence of the later 20th century. His cooperative spirit was favorably received by posterity, but interpreted in contrasting ways according to the different opinions of his assessors. Whitfield's American credentials have been contested and his influence over the revolution exaggerated. And he became a popular icon, venerated in many circles. Here was a diverse character whose various aspects could be emphasized from time to time according to the preferences of commentators. One thing was certain. As Elizabeth Charles's character in her novel, The Diary of Mrs. Kitty Trevelyan remarked, Whitfield was no commonplace fanatic. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Bevington. And, and uh, I think we have time for some uh, questions, if you have them for Professor Bevington. The man I mentioned was actually called J.P. Gledston. Now, ultimately, it would be the same family in the 17th century with variant spellings. But he was a congregational minister, and congregational ministers would never have ventured to spell their name in the same way as the great William Ewart Gladstone, Prime Minister, whom they followed to the grave. William Ewart Gladstone only referred to Whitfield, I think, on one occasion that I'm aware of. In the 1870s, he visited Spurgeon's Tabernacle and was interested in what made for great preaching. And he wrote an article afterwards saying, uh, great preachers pierce the conscience. One of his examples is Whitfield. So Whitfield does not loom large for him. Whitfield does not loom large for most high church Anglicans. <laughs> The question was, uh, does Whitfieldites mean people who had the general characteristics of Whitfield, or is it a more precise definition? Uh, I was using it in a more precise way. I was thinking of followers of Whitfield, those who were actually associated with him, people who were converted under his ministry, people who joined the Calvinistic net, uh, Methodist network. Very strong in uh, Wales, where it created a denomination. Very significant in Gloucestershire. It's very interesting how in his native county he proved exceedingly influential, just as John Wesley did in his native Lincolnshire. It's almost as though favourite sonship actually has an influence in religion. But, the, but Whitfieldites could be used in a much looser sense of those who were touched by a particular quality of him. But if, you used it, if, one, if one used it in that sense, I think it would lose much of its significant content. So I was using it in a much narrower sense of those deeply and immediately affected. Can you say anything about how you think Whitfield ought to be remembered? And, uh, and whether, um, and especially for those who want to remember him as edifying, but not to be naive. So I'm thinking, you know, the matter of truth crowd and, and Kind of, um, you know, Harry Stowe, Deb Boyce Lenther, and others that are making sharp criticisms. Can you say anything about how he ought to be 
I'm a historian. I therefore can get out of any question that requires normative judgments. However, <laughs> I don't have to be only a historian, and therefore I would venture that the formula that you've used is a perfect formula. We should look for interpretations of people in the past that are edifying but not naive. I love that form of words. In a sense, we have uh, an instance almost physically before us. Thomas H. Kidd of Bailey University has just produced a biography which is edifying but not naive. It is edifying because it is such good history. It goes into detail from the sources. And I have a general principle, and this is it, that the best history is the best apologetic. So if one is looking for material that is to be edifying, one should aim to do the best possible history. Now that history must be very thorough in its use of sources, but must also be readable. And so I would look for um, studies of Whitfield, whether general or particular about specific aspects of the man, that have those qualities that are really good histories. The qualities that we look for will, I think, fall under those various headings I've mentioned, and one can look for them, but always look for the best histories, and that's where the most edification will be obtained. first thing to be said is <clears throat> that was a comment made about him retrospectively and it's wrong. That is to say, he was a very convinced Anglican. He believed in the founding documents of the Church of England, the 39 articles which defined his doctrines, which he would sometimes allude to. He believed also in the value of the Book of Common Prayer. He read services on ships going over the Atlantic, we heard this morning. He read prayers and he read from the Book of Common Prayer. But he was a particular type of Anglican. He was the type of Anglican who believes that the gospel that unites Christian believers of any denomination is more important than church order. Uh, it doesn't stop you being a very conscientious Anglican, but it does mean that you believe that you have a duty to cooperate with people of different churchmanship Presbyterians, Congregationalists, Methodists, even Baptists, in the promotion of the gospel. And Whitfield was that type of Anglican. They do exist. There are quite a few of them around. I was wondering, um, as we think about what memory, uh, what memory often has a material aspect, and, uh, is there a material legacy with you? Uh, yes, the tea caddy I mentioned. Uh, that is to say that objects connected with him do survive. Now, one or two of us, including yourself, went across to see the pulpit, the field pulpit that Whitfield used. We can go and vener venerate those physical remains here at Baylor uh, over this weekend, and I certainly recommend it. It's a fascinating object. People did keep things connected with Whitfield. Um, I don't think that they did it to the extent they did with Wesley, or with another 18th century figure, Bonnie Prince Charlie. I remarked to somebody, Tommy, who was going to um, Scotland in, in the spring, that in museums in the northern half of Scotland, every display has a very large number of bits of hair, totally indistinguishable from other bits of hair, but are labelled lock, said to be from the head of Bonnie Prince Charlie. Now, Bonnie Prince Charlie's relics abound. And you can't say that Whitfield left as much as that. But nevertheless, to a greater extent than almost any other figure in evangelical history, I think physical objects relating to him have survived. And the bones, the treatment of the bones in the crypt is quite extraordinary. And I think in my experience unparalleled. Evangelicals do not tend to venerate bones. Maybe I can take the, the, the last question. Um, I, we talked a little bit last night about the, the accusation of, of Whitfield being shallow, uh, theologically shallow. What, what do you think the, the origin of that contention uh, is, and, I, and, and whether or not you're persuaded by my insistence that he was not shallow uh, th theologically? I mean, what, where do you think that that, uh, that charge is, 
is coming from, from your perspective? Well, firstly, it has to be said he wasn't shallow. I think the speaker last night was absolutely right. He, he knew what he was... He knew what he, Whitfield knew what he was th thinking, thinking about. He was influenced by significant theologians and was capable of evaluating and incorporating what he said. Number two, the people that I quoted as being the chief critics of the man as um, shallow were, in fact, broader theologically historians of the 20th century. I think it's in those circles that the critique reached its apogee. But thirdly, its origins do go back much earlier than that. When in the 19th century, people began looking at the text of Whitfield's sermons, not just for edification, but to evaluate them, and that began in the middle of the century. They were surprised to find that the text was not as exciting as they expected it to be. Spurgeon was much more exciting than Whitfield to read on the published page. And they then explained that by saying, well, he was shallow. He didn't have the profundity of some of our great preachers of the Victorian age. I think that's a misdiagnosis. I think the difficulty with appreciating the impact of Whitfield in his own day, the, width, the impact he intended and the impact he achieved, is that he combined action, doing things in the pulpit, weeping in the pulpit, throwing his whole self histrionically into the delivery of a sermon. That was absent. You couldn't read that in the mid-19th century. And people misinterpreted an absence of the totality of the Whitfield experience for intellectual shallowness, which it was not. Let's thank Dr. Bevington again.